defend right. or or deal with it and i think that is that is part of it you know it's we heard this so much where your mind goes your body will follow and that's very very key too because uh, i mean that statement alone where your mind goes now let's also imagine that and it's not too hard of an imagination effort at that either that all of our planet is one open mind being fed information through the mainstream media so someone out there is controlling the mainstream media and in that effort they're attempting to control our collective mind however much we all decide to share individually but basically what they want to do is they want to direct our mind as to where we should all go and as a result of that if you disagree with it there's many different approaches to disagreeing with uh, the mainstream media including just turning it off and never listening to it but then there's the also the other approaches of being able to use what is released in the mainstream media as a guide to where they would like you to go so in that sense it forms like strategic analysis if you're opposing their particular viewpoint <laughs> and that's kind of what we have to do i think is we have to look at the symbols that they're putting out there and deciding where they're trying to get us to go to in our rolling and then decide that we don't want to roll that way and the minute that we do that in a large enough collective and it actually needs to not be that large then things radically change for instance i read this very nice analysis that said that the american revolutionary war was actually won and i believe they stated in 1771 when 2% of the american populace at the time had made it up in their own minds that a revolution was coming and that the war itself was merely playing it out but that essentially it had been won at that stage because they'd had 2% of the populace and that was all that was required so and but and when we actually by the way when the 1776 rolls around we actually get into that level of of confrontation barely 5% of the populace was actively involved there may have been 60% support for the action but really only 5% of the people were out running around causing problems for the british so you know, applying that same level of of knowledge we can say that well we know for instance the chinese are are desperate to put at least 20% of the Han Chinese racial stock in any occupied province and that's why they go to the trouble of the uh, displacements and repositioning of their populace all the time and, and that, that's to maintain a particular level of control because they suspect that less than 20% Han Chinese will make that province likely to rebel and and they'll lose it and the Romans followed this plan and so on so we can extract a number of very nice clues from all of this that really if we get 5 or 6% of the populace that is actively pursuing the agenda of change then it's almost a de facto occurrence it's just a matter of waiting for it to all blossom and we also know that if there is less than 20% of a garrisoning force you can't garrison a country so if we just assume that the united states had say 300 million in there then we're looking at having to have 20 and 30 million people involved in the garrisoning of the other 300 million about about uh 15 million for active garrison and then about 15 million in supporting troops and logistics and so we the idea that for instance that um I'm sure you'll see internet sites where they say basically if you read through them it says worry worry be afraid 22,000 US troops are going to be brought back in full battle gear ready to patrol the United States and clamp down on all of you people that the government doesn't like and it's like okay i can see the that they're right their data seems to suggest that that indeed is what the military is doing but 22,000 troops in a in a country our size no it's not meaningful uh in the size of iraq it wasn't even really meaningful we didn't have anywhere near the number of troops on the ground for a long time to control the situation and the only way we're controlling it now is by slicing and dicing the whole country up something that just is not feasible within the united states so the idea that we're going to end up with a occupying force of united states soldiers and a weird kind of um take on fascism there it may indeed be the plan of the powers that be but we can also state flat out that unless the populace is actively goaded in through their their mental perception into fear it's not going to work that is totally mm. key because we're seeing signs of it already you know in little bits and pieces there that 
It's one of the symbols. I think it's one of the clues of what they want. They want to instill a greater amount of fear because it seems that that is what best controls large numbers of people. Sure. And, and the and individual is individuals. not controlled by external forces, but only by the emotional load on their own mind. And so they try and keep you rattled and unsure, semi-hypnotized, and, and really falling into certain negative emotions. And they use uh, patriotism, uh, spectacles, in the form of, you know, the big NASCAR races or big football games, that sort of thing. And the fear mode of, oh, oh be afraid, better watch out, we're going to have 3,000 battle-hardened troops here in full battle rattle gear, and you hear all these nasty words associated with it, basically saying, watch out and be afraid. And it's like, no, if you look at it realistically, even 22,000 American troops, I don't know how many of them you could get to actually enforce uh, through um, brutality any kind of, of laws or, or sort of um, uh, coercion against the American people. Half of them, I would think, would be unwilling at best and might sort of halfway go along with it just so that they wouldn't get any trouble. But even if you had 22,000 of them intent on on being the the nastiest uh, fascist anybody had ever seen, all that really does is precipitate the point where several millions of people decide that's enough, and we stop doing this sort of thing. Just like Gandhi said, it's not possible to govern a country of any size without the consent of the governed. Mm. So the greater the fear throughout the masses, the less resources it takes to do to the next government. move. Yes, and we see this constantly. The, if you wanted to do a sweep, which we do all the time, of government websites, the amount of words that, that are into the bespoke fear category, which includes perhaps, I want to say maybe 17,000, 18,000 actual derivatives in English, uh, is way up in all of the government sites. And if you notice, we have an entirely different tone in, quote, leadership than we had, say, in the previous Depression. If you were to go back and analyze all of the speeches that came out of FDR, the language he used was calming, attempting to get everybody to cooperate. So it was in a calming, cooperative vein, whereas all the language out of Bush is hurry, hurry, fear, fear, hurry, hurry, fear, fear. And it's been that way for these last eight years, a decidedly different tone than what we had in the 30s, so that we know that we're dealing with a different set of circumstances and our leaders, quote, our leaders are being pushed into different kinds of control mechanisms than we'd seen before. We see a lot of this in our language work because basically that's all we do is compare emotions that are coming out in various different forms on the Internet. And it's actually rather shocking to see our, our government and officialdom trying actively to induce fear in the populace. And it gets even worse than that because during this last, quote, bailout, or the first one here in September when they were really pushing it, there were the threats to the, not only to the populace, oh, be afraid, we don't know what's coming, unprecedented, you know, all of this nasty language about the economics, but they even took it so far as to try and impress on Congress people, do it or, or uh, you know, be afraid, basically, that we're going to go ahead and declare martial law. And this was prior to the elections, and the ramifications of which would have been entirely unknown. So, not only is the fear language being used on the populace, it's also being used on the popular representatives, however much they might be part of the mainstream power elite is immaterial. The fact is that someone up there thinks they have to control those fellows with fear language as well, which is another indication, really, that everything's getting out of hand. Mm. And that didn't seem to bother anybody too much, other than a couple of them that testified about that. Correct. Very interesting. Most of them, I think, are in the uh, what, what I would call the permanent political elite class. Right. So we're really at that stage of, say, the Roman Empire, where the Senate, which had been a body that just, in essence, elevated people out of the lower house, um, out of the plebeian status temporarily while they were senators, finally became an entitled, privileged position. We see this as the fourth generation as, you know, Carolyn Kennedy is going to take over uh, Hillary Clinton's seat, etc., that sort of thing. So, and we, and as a matter of fact, we're dealing with um, a current president, Bush, who is the unelected. Bear in mind, he was selected in the year 2000. He never was really elected. Right. But he's the unelected son of a former president. That's the same situation as they have in North Korea. 
with uh, the various, and also we've seen it in other places where we've had dictatorship like that. So there's no real difference between the dictatorship in the U.S. and the dictatorship in any other country except for the sheer size of the situation that we're dealing with. And our political elite class has to be viewed that way. So it really starts coming down to some of the other broader themes that we're seeing in our data, like this, the burgeoning uh, movement that we're calling the planetary populist movement. Oh, that's a good one. Let's stop right there and take a break, real quick break, and then we can continue that without interrupting you. Okay, sounds You're good. You're listening to Cliff, halfpasthuman.com on Beyond the Ordinary, and we shall be back. We're back with Cliff, and he's going to utterly curdle at this, but Nancy and I are getting, not only are we more awed by the amazing amount of work and how goes into it, what goes into it. But this guy's a genius. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Now we'll, we'll uncurl and come uh, up. <laughs> yep, yep. Okay, so it's come up and we've laid that to rest and, yeah. and we'll just go on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and the thing is that um, I'm really anti-elite down to a level that would that would shock people. And as a subset of that, though, we must be intellectually honest and apply that to ourselves because the life unexamined is not worth living. Mm. And oh, so I Montaigne. have to say that. I, so I have to say that. Yeah, I'm I'm a smart fellow, but I'm not necessarily smarter than a lot of people, and most people have things that I don't. So it's not like I really like the idea of special or elevation or anything that's ego stroking. It really just gets in the way, and it's part of that whole. Uh, Taoist kind of um, completely re- complete reality school sort of thing. If I'm out there stroking my own ego, then first I'm going to fall into this cult of personality trap, which traps the people that are at the celebrity level as well as those around them. But then also it gets in the way of the work and, and appreciating the universe for really the intense, surprising creation that it is. I don't really just don't want to project that stuff on on um, myself, and I also have to be real careful not to put it into my work because my own personal views could very easily be, and I'm sure they are involved in the interpretation, but they could be much more prominent than they are now. But getting back to our... Well, let me tell you, though. Yeah. Of, to me, genius is not only having taken the time to read, to study, to know, to learn, and continuously do so, but the ability to put many abstract things or seemingly unrelated things together to form a bigger picture, which is, to me, what we have to do in self-examination. It's like Nancy was talking about earlier, and not go, ooh, this is bad. You yeah. just look at it and say, oh, okay, it is, is yeah. this something... 